Hello and welcome back to Project Explained Physics. Today we're going to be preparing for the AP Physics C Mechanics Semester 1 final exam. Um, specifically, I'm going to be going over a lot of multiple choice questions from kinematics, forces, work, and energy, momentum, and rotation. So the multiple choice questions that I'm going to be going over in this video are selected questions that I am deciding to solve for all of you guys from a worksheet or practice multiple choice test that I've made, which will also be linked in the comment section below. Um, in the comment section below, um, on the worksheet, the answers are indicated, but there are no um, long detailed solutions for um, all of the questions. So the ones that are really crucial, um, I'm explaining in depth in this video. And if you watch this video, and are able to solve through all of the problems confidently by yourself and get the correct answer, then you will pretty much be prepared for your AP Physics C exam. So going to question one, an object with mass m moves with position function r of t is equal to a sine ti plus b cosine tj plus ctk on the interval from zero to pi over two. We wanna find the work done. So there's kind of two approaches that we can take. The longer one would be to do the integral of f dot dr, um, which would work, but we're all lazy, so we're going to do the faster way, which is to employ work kinetic energy theorem. So we know that the work is the change in kinetic energy, and we know that kinetic energy is um, one half mv squared, right? So this is what we want to find, okay? So first thing we need to do, we've been given the position function, we need to find the velocity vector first. So the derivative of the position function is the velocity vector. So the derivative of a sine t is a cosine t times i. Derivative of b cosine t, derivative of cosine is negative sine, so that'd be um, negative b sine of t j. And then derivative of ct is obviously just c, and that will be times k. So then we have v of 0 and v of pi over 2. At v of 0, cosine of 0 is 1, so we get ai. Sine of 0 is 0, so we get 0j, and then ck, because that's just that part is just constant. And then at pi over 2, we have the cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So we have 0i minus bj because the sine of pi over 2 is 1. So negative b times 1 is negative b times j. And then again, ck. So we need to find the speed at each of these points. Actually, the speed squared um, because that's what we have in our kinetic energy formula, 1 half mv squared. Um, so the speed in this case would be the square root of a squared plus c squared, and then that just whole squared. So that's just a squared plus c squared. That would be the speed squared. And then similarly over here, that would just be b squared plus c squared. So then the kinetic energy at the first point is 1 half m times a squared plus c squared. And then the kinetic energy at 2 is equal to 1 half um, times b squared plus c squared. So if we take the difference of both of them, we will get the change in kinetic energy, which should be equal to one half times m b squared minus a squared, because the c squareds just cancel out. And that gives us choice b. Next one is a little bit of a longer one. Um, find the work done by the force field F of XY is equal to XI plus Y plus 2J. In moving an object along an arc of the cycloid, R of T is equal to T minus the sine of TI plus 1 minus the cosine of TJ for 0 to 2 pi on T. So for this one, we are actually going to have to use the F dot DR formula for work. So if we want to expand that even more, that would be the integral from the first time to the second time of f of r of t dotted with r prime of t dt. I'm just substituting in for x, the x values given by our position function. 
um, of the of the curve of the path that the object is taking. So for x, we would substitute in t minus the sine of t because obviously, in order to actually carry out that integral, we need to have everything in terms of t. So I'm just going to find f of r of t first. So that would be t minus the sine of t i, right? Just plugging this part into there. And then for the y component, that would be 1 minus the cosine of t for this part going in for y, and then plus 2, j, which should be equal to t minus the sine of t i plus 3 minus the cosine of t j. Now we need to find r prime of t. That's just the derivative. So the derivative of the first component is 1 minus the cosine of t i. Once again, derivative of sine is cosine, so the derivative of negative sine, negative cosine. And the derivative of 1 for the second component is 0. And then the derivative of cosine is negative sine, so the derivative of negative cosine is just sine. Okay, so now we need to dot them together. So the dot product, f of r of t dotted with r prime of t. So we just multiply the x component of the first vector times the x component of the second, y component of the first vector times the y component of the second vector. So that would be equal to t minus the sine of t times 1 minus the cosine of t um, plus 3 minus the cosine of t times the sine of t, which then equals t minus t cosine t minus the sine of t plus sine t cosine t um, plus 3 sine t minus sine t cosine t. So the sine t's cosine t's just cancel out. And then from there, we get t minus the cos t cosine of t minus sine of t plus 3 sine t which we can simplify further to t minus t cosine t plus 2 times the sine of t and then that's our integrand so integral 0 to 2 pi of t minus t cosine t plus 2 sine of t Obviously, because this is a physics class, you're allowed to use a calculator to, ev to evaluate these integrals. And then when you evaluate that integral, you get 2 pi squared, which is choice B. So next question is a question about vectors. Um, and it will also help us review those trigonometric identities. So the vector v is equal to the cosine of alpha cosine of beta times i plus cosine alpha sine beta j plus sine of alpha k. And we want to know, is it a null vector? So is it equal to zero? Is it constant in magnitude? Is it a unit vector or is it a normal vector? So we automatically know that d cannot be the right answer because a vector can be only be normal relative to something else. So no vector just in and of itself is a normal vector. So that answer choice we can immediately rule out as a BS answer. So from there, what we want to do is we want to look at really at the magnitude squared because that's how we're going to be able to use all of our trigonometric identities. So if we look at the magnitude squared, we get cosine squared alpha, cosine squared beta plus cosine squared alpha sine squared beta plus sine squared beta. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out cosine squared alpha. So I get cosine squared alpha times cosine squared beta plus sine squared beta plus sine squared beta. So from Pythagorean identity, we know that cosine squared beta plus sine squared beta cancels out to 1. So then we can simplify this to cosine squared alpha plus sine squared um, beta. Or sine squared alpha, sorry. This should have been alpha. Alpha. 
right? And then once again, we can just use Pythagorean identity again, and the answer is one, so it is a unit vector. So this was the sine of alpha. I accidentally wrote it down as the sine of beta the first time. I apologize about that, but yes. So we're gonna dissolve it two times using Pythagorean identity, and the magnitude is a constant number. So we know it's a constant vector, but being even a further subset of that, because the magnitude is equal to one, it is a unit vector. So here's another kind of conceptual question about rolling and rotation. A solid sphere of mass m and moment of inertia i is equal to 2 mr squared by 5, or 2 fifths mr squared, that's just the moment of inertia of a solid sphere, is positioned on an incline of angle phi. The incline is frictionless. The ball center of mass is located directly above its contact point with the incline, which of the following is true. The ball rolls down the incline with the majority rotational kinetic energy. The ball does not move. The ball would reach the bottom of the incline in the same amount of time as a rod of the same mass, or the ball will rotate, but slip occasionally. So the really important thing, and the reason why I included this question, is you need to be reading these questions carefully. If you see the key part of this question, you can answer it immediately. And the key line is the incline is frictionless. If the incline is frictionless, there's no frictional force to allow for rolling, right? So the there's only translational motion. There is no rotational motion. So if there is no rotational motion, this is wrong. Obviously, we know it's going to move because there is a net force acting on it um, along the incline, that mg sine theta component. And the ball is not going to rotate. There's no torque on it. So C, the ball would reach the bottom of the incline in the same amount of time as a rod of the same mass. Um, and that would make sense because when you only have translational motion, rotational inertia doesn't matter. Rotational inertia only plays a part when we have some kind of rotational motion. Usually we're talking about rolling without slipping. Um, but if there's only translational motion and it's frictionless, all objects will reach the bottom in the same amount of time with the same velocity. So the next question is a dynamics problem. So in the system above, the incline is given an acceleration A to the left. Assuming no friction, find all of the forces on the sphere in terms of W, the weight of the sphere. So basically, they haven't really told us what R1 and R2 and R actually are, right? So what we need to do is we need to kind of establish our own forces. We can call them, I'm going to call them um, N2 here and then N1 from here, and then obviously W, and then we just need to rewrite them in a form that matches the answer choices. This is pretty common um, in this kind of setup. So we just wanna sum the forces in the X and Y first. So we know the sum of the forces in the X direction is equal to N1 minus N2, um, and we wanna take the horizontal component of that. So this angle here is 30, which means that this angle here is 60. So it would be N2 cosine of 60 degrees, and that's equal to MA, or more specifically, W by G into A, since we're writing everything in terms of the weight, the weight is just MG. So because obviously in the X direction, it is accelerating to the left. And then some of the forces in the Y direction, we have N2 times the sine of 60 degrees, right? The vertical component of N2, is balancing the weight or the gravitational force, so that's equal to zero. So the first thing that's really easy to find is that N2 is equal to W divided by the sine of 60 degrees, which is actually the same thing as W times um, one, or W over the cosine of 30 degrees. Okay, that's just, uh, we need to keep that trick in mind. So sine of 90 minus theta is equal to the cosine of theta. We're just applying the identity here. That means that N2 is W secant 30 degrees. So we know that B will be correct since the form of N2 or the magnitude of N2 is matching the form given by answer choice B. Um, but it's a select all that apply question. So we have to keep going. So if we want to find N1, we get that N1 is equal to N2 cosine 60 degrees plus W by G into A. Um, and once again, we know that N2 or cosine of 60 is equal to the sine of 30. So that'd be N2 sine 30 degrees 
plus w by g into a, and this matches the form of answer choice d. So b and d are both correct. So number eight is a projectiles question. So a ball is thrown upward with initial velocity v naught is equal to 15 meters per second and an angle of 30 degrees with the horizontal. The thrower stands near the top of a long hill which slopes downward at an angle of 20 degrees. When does the ball strike the incline? So the first thing we always want to do is draw, draw a picture. So we have 20 degrees for the incline angle and then we know that the initial velocity vector is thrown at 30 degrees to the horizontal which means that this angle here is 20. So whenever we have projectiles being thrown on an incline, just like we do with forces, we take x to be the direction along the incline, and then y to be the direction perpendicular to the incline. It just makes it a lot easier for us to calculate everything. So I'm just going to set up my projectile equations. Um, because they're only asking when, we don't actually need to set up the equation for the x direction. If they were asking for the range, then we would have to do that. But since they're only asking for the time value, we only need the y direction. So y of t is equal to 15t sine of 50 degrees, right? Because relative to the incline, the initial velocity vector angle is 50 degrees minus one half g cosine of 20 degrees that... Um, component of gravity perpendicular to the incline, just like we looked at with forces, um, one half g cosine 20 degrees times t squared. So then from there, we can just factor out t. So we get t times 15 sine of 50 degrees minus one half g cosine of 20 degrees um, into t is equal to zero. So we know that this part will equal zero when the projectile hits the ground. So we know that 15 sine theta of uh, sine of 50 minus one half g cosine of 20 degrees into t is equal to zero. So from there, t should just be equal to 30 times the sine of 50 degrees over g times the cosine of 20 degrees, and if we take g to be 9.8, we should get 2.49 seconds. That's answer choice D. So the next question is a dynamics and circular motion question. Um, you guys also did a lab on this for the conical pendulum, and that's what this question is about. So a small ball is fastened to a string 24 centimeters long and suspended from a fixed point P to make a conical pendulum, as shown above. The ball describes a horizontal circle about a center vertically under point P, and the string makes an angle 15 degrees with the vertical. So that means this angle will be 75 degrees. So like most of our other problems with dynamics, we want to sum the forces in the x and y. So in the y direction, we know it's an equilibrium, right? So we know that t times the sine of 75 degrees minus mg should equal zero. So that very quickly gives us the value of t. t is just equal to mg divided by the sine of 75, right? And then in the x direction, we have uniform circular motion. So t times the cosine of 45 degrees is equal to mv squared over r, where r is the distance to the center of the circle. And keep in mind, r is not a value given to us. Um, it's something that we're going to have to substitute in for later in terms of the length of the string, which is given to us, but we'll do that later. So from there, we can cancel, um, we can substitute in t. So we know mg cosine 45 divided by the sine of, uh, sorry, this should be this cosine of 75, sorry. So mg times the cosine of 75 over the sine of 75 should equal to mg times the cotangent of 75 degrees, and that should be equal to mv squared by r. So m and m cancel out. And then from there, we get that v is equal to the square root of gr cotangent of 75 degrees. So now we need to substitute in for r. So we know that 
um, the, si the sine of theta is equal to h over l, and we know that the cosine of 75 is equal to r over l. I'm just showing it out this way so that you, if you ever get stuck with the trigonometric, um, like which one is L cosine theta or L sine theta, just write out what cosine is, what sine is, and it'll become evident which one is the right one, right? So in this case, we get that R is equal to L times the cosine of 75 degrees. So we just plug that in there. And then once you plug that into your calculator, you will get 354, uh, or sorry, not 354. You will get a value of 40.4 centimeters per second, which is A. So this one was an interesting one because it wasn't in SI units. It wasn't in meters per second. Um, but as long as we're staying consistent with our units, we will obviously get the right answer. We don't need to necessarily convert to SI and then convert back to whatever units are given in the problem. And like I just showed here, whenever you're plugging things into your calculator, make sure that you're kind of checking to and asking yourself, does this answer seem reasonable? Because the first time I plugged it into my calculator, got a way larger number and I was like, that is not right. So obviously then I replugged it in and made sure I plugged it in correctly and I got the right answer. Because obviously for multiple choice questions, it's not your setup that earns you points. You can lose the entire problem's worth of points just from one silly calculation um, error at the end, plugging it into your calculator. So it's really important to have those checks. So 13, which is the following, is a graph of a particle at unstable equilibrium. So hopefully we know that it's A, unstable, is concave down like that, where there's no restoring force, stable, and in fact the force that is there is pulling the mass away from the equilibrium position. Stable, there is a restoring force, right? It's going opposite to the initial motion of the mass, pulling it back to the equilibrium position. And then neutral is just flat. There is no force acting on it. Another conceptual one relating to rotation. A spool of thread rests on a level tabletop, and we want to know which of the following directions of the force would lead to no rotation. So basically what we want to look at is that the um, radial arm so I'll call that R, and the force, F, are parallel. Because if they're parallel, that sine of theta component goes to zero, because theta equals zero. So just from here, we can see that the answer is C, because the radial arm, which is this, and the force direction, which is this, are both in the same direction. They're along the same line, and thus... Um, have the same argument, the same angle, and thus that sine of theta component is zero because the difference in angle between them is zero. So that won't cause the spool to rotate. There will be translation because obviously there is a force acting on it, but there would be no net torque on it. 16, another UCM problem with dynamics in it as well, obviously. So in the figure above, the mass M is held by two strings, and it's rotating with angular velocity, and we want to find the tension, specifically T1, which is labeled in the diagram. So once again, sum all the forces in the X and Y. So in the X direction, we have um, T1 sine theta plus T2 sine theta is equal to M omega squared R. Note that it's sine because this is theta, not over here. And then in the y direction, we get that T cosine T1 cosine theta minus mg minus T2 cosine theta equals zero. So because we want to find T1, we should find a substitution for T2. So T2 is equal to T1 minus mg divided by the cosine of theta. So 
dividing everything by the cosine of theta yields that um, T1 and T2 are just by themselves because they were initially multiplied by that. And then we have mg over the cosine of theta. So then we can plug that back into this equation. So then we get T1 sine theta plus T1 minus mg divided by the cosine of theta sine theta equals m omega squared r. So then we get t1 sine theta plus t1 sine theta um, minus mg times the tangent of theta sine over cosine is tan um, is equal to m omega squared r, right? So then that gives 2t1 sine of theta is equal to m times g times the tangent of theta plus omega squared r. And then that gives that t1 is equal to m divided by 2 sine theta divided by g tan theta plus omega squared r. And that is the same as choice b. 20 is a center of mass problem. Um, pretty simple. It's not a continuous center of mass question where you need to use the calculus formation. Um, for a multiple choice question, usually you're just going to be using the algebraic formula. Um, so we have three particles located along the vertices of an equilateral triangle, and we want to find the center of mass of the system. So what we need to do is just employ our center of mass formulas. We know that x bar will be equal to the sum of mi xi divided by the sum of mi. So, and we'll do the same thing for the y, obviously. Same formula, just instead of x, we have y. So, if we take um, a standard coordinate system where the origin is 0, 0, and working from there, the x-coordinate of the 2-kilogram mass is 0. The x-coordinate of the 6-kilogram mass is 1 half of the side length, which is 0. 0.25. And then the x-coordinate of the 4 kilogram mass is 0.5. And dividing that by the total mass of 12 gives us 0.29. So that's the center of mass. 0.29 meters is the center of mass in the x direction. The y direction, we have 2 times 0 for the 2 kilogram mass. 6 times, so we have a 30, 60, 90 triangle here. So this is... Um, 60 degrees, and we know that the side length is 0. 0.5, so in a 30, 60, 90 triangle, the um, length of the side opposite to the 60 degree angle is square root 3 over 2 times the hypotenuse, which is 0. 0.5, right? So that's what we're doing here. So that is the distance of the 6 kilogram mass from the origin vertically. Um, in the vertical direction. So that'd be 6 times 0. 0.5 times the square root of 3 over 2, and then plus 4 times 0. Obviously, the 4 kilogram mass also lies on the x-axis. Divided by 12 gives us 0. 0.22 meters. Okay, so 0. 0.22 meters. So that matches up with choice B. Um, for most center of mass questions, you're just going to be given n number of particles, usually, um, or sometimes you could also have um, the setup where you have a wire that's bent, and in that case, you just consider the center of mass of each side of the wire as its own object, and then from there, you can employ the same formula. Usually, if you were to have a continuous mass distribution, that would be on the FRQ, in which case you just substitute the summation with a integral and you do it in terms of um, dx. And usually um, there will be some kind of substitution in there. Usually they'll give you like the linear mass density, lambda, and then that you can make a substitution, lambda is equal to dm by dx and actually solve that integral. 20, 22 is a momentum problem. So a missile launcher of mass 4,400 kilograms fires horizontally, um, a rocket of mass 110 kilograms, and recoils up a smooth inclined plane and rises to a height of 4 meters. And we want to find the initial speed of the rocket. So we actually have to work backwards in this case. So we know that energy will be conserved. So mg is equal to 1 half mv squared, at least after the rocket is released. 
So um, we can calculate the actual velocity, initial velocity of the missile launcher. I'll call it VM. So just algebraically, VM should be equal to the square root of 2GH. And then we also know initially the momentum of the system was zero. So that means that the mass of the missile launcher, big M, times its velocity, which was the square root of 2GH, has to be equal in magnitude to the initial momentum of the missile, which would be little m times V0. So then V0 would be big M times the square root of 2GH divided by M. So then if we plug in all our numbers for big M, 4,400 kilograms, H, 4 meters, and then little m, 110 kilograms, treating G as 9.8, we get... 354 meters per second. So choice D. So we're nearing the end here. So here's an angular momentum problem. So actually something that people often forget is that the true vector form of the angular momentum of a point particle is M R cross V. Okay. A lot of people just say M V R um, but this isn't necessarily true um, because, first of all, that's the magnitude. And that's assuming that the velocity vector and the radial um, r, or the radial distance, are perpendicular to each other, which is not always true. So in this case, they've given us vectors. So they want us to actually calculate the angular momentum. So we just need to do this cross product. So m, and then like most other cross products, we write the determinant. So um, R cross V, so we have I, J, and then K in the first row. For R, we have negative 2, 4, and then 6. And then for V, we have 5, 4, and then 6, right? So then we have M. So we have... Cross out the row, cross out the column. So we have 4 times 6 minus 4 times 6. That's just 0 minus j, that would be um, 6 times, uh, sorry, negative, negative 2 times 6 minus 5 times 6 would be negative 42, and then plus k, we have negative 8, minus 20, negative 28, which gives us m times 42j, because two negatives make a positive, minus 28k, which gives us answer choice c. So it's really important to remember that if they give you vectors, it's m r cross v, and whether there are vectors or you're just calculating magnitudes, remember that it is a cross product, so you need to consider the perpendicular components um, multiplied with each other. That's something really important that people often forget about angular momentum. Um, so just like the way you would with torque, um, same applies to angular momentum. So 30, another vector problem. Really, I'm trying to help you guys refresh all those trigonometric identities. So since those can help you on multiple choice questions, really simplify an algebraic expression a lot faster and get the answer. So once again, we're going to con consider the magnitude squared. First thing is hopefully you recognize that this is the sine of 2 phi and this is the cosine of 2 phi. Um, if not, I, um, you should go back and review your trigonometric identity, specifically your double angle identities. Um, so in this case, we just get sine squared 2 phi plus cosine squared 2 phi plus pi squared. So once again, we have that Pythagorean identity. This goes to one. So one plus pi squared. So it's a constant value, but this is not equal to one. So it is not a unit vector. It's not a null vector, and it's not an orthonormal vector, obviously, because once again, orthonormal or normal, that's relative to something. So a vector just by itself cannot be orthonormal or normal. So it is a constant value that's not equal to one. It's a constant vector. 33, 
Which of the following statements are true? So this will work in energy problem. It's conceptual. Potential energy is always positive. That is not true, which will lead us to our answer later on. Kinetic energy can be negative or positive. Also not true because the one half mv, the v that we have in there is the speed, not the velocity. And the speed can only ever be positive. So kinetic energy can only be positive or zero. Potential energy can be negative. That is true. So depending on our reference position, for example, if I'm in the second story of a building and I um, establish the reference position uh, for potential gravitational potential energy to be the second floor of the building, then someone on the first floor relative to that reference position has a negative gravitational potential energy. So potential energy absolutely can be negative. Kinetic energy cannot be positive. Once again, it has to be positive or zero. And then in the presence of friction, mechanical energy is conserved. No, that's not true because friction is not a conservative force. So independence of path does not apply. So mechanical energy is not conserved in the presence of, of friction. 35 is another work in energy conceptual question. This is a very classic type of question that they love to ask because it forces you to kind of look at graphs and interpret graphs and then apply that to your physics knowledge. So here they're asking which object experiences the greatest change in kinetic energy. So we know that the change in kinetic energy is the same thing as the work done, which is the integral of f dx. So, and the integral of f dx is basically just the area under these curves, right? So whichever one has the greatest area under the curve will experience the greatest change in kinetic energy. So A is the answer because obviously compared to all the other graphs, its area is much larger as shown in the question or as shown on the graphs. So with this question, we're assuming that their graphs are to scale, which for all of these questions, the graphs always are to scale because if they're not to scale, you can't answer the question. So you just look at it. We see that A has the greatest area under the curve, which means that the work done is the greatest greatest change in kinetic energy. Okay, last question. Another um, kind of forces-ish question. It's a statics question. So the pulley, pulleys and strings shown in the figure are smooth and of negligible mass. So for the system to remain in equilibrium, the angle theta should be. So once again, like we often do, we are going to right, our force equation. So we are looking at the y direction because obviously in the x direction, they're just going to cancel each other out. The other things we immediately know that the tension is equal to mg because these masses are in equilibrium and the tension is the only force acting um, that is helping counteract gravity. And it's in the 180 degrees to the gravitational vector. So we know that t minus mg is zero. So t is equal to mg. So from there, we know that 2t times by the cosine of theta, because once again, theta is over here, not over here in this question. So 2t cosine theta should be equal to the square root of 2 times mg. So then we know that 2mg cosine theta should be equal to the square root of two times mg, just substituting in mg for t. And then from there, we can divide both sides by two mg, and we get that the cosine of theta is equal to the square root of two over two. So obviously, hopefully from your unit circle, you remember that means theta is equal to 45 degrees. So that is answer choice C. So hopefully, now that you've looked at all these problems, you know that um, trig is very important. So that is something even aside from just the physics that you've learned, make sure you brush up on your trig because that's something that's very important. And also generally the units that students tend to have the most problems with are um, momentum and rotation definitely. So I suggest um, you go through the problems in the worksheet below, especially paying in mind um, that those tend to be the hardest units. So specifically looking at angular momentum, torque, rolling, things like that. So we wish you the best of luck on your AP Physics final. Um, we will be back next semester with problems for the last two units of mechanics, which are simple harmonic motion and gravitation. And